Merci. Ja, per gesti preferi. Ja. Tak, um, šaš, speča, ja skoristaju se na hode vse što govorite o prinsku. I would like to use this opportunity to um, talk in Ukrainian because as I've realized recently talking about things that I relate to very closely that are important for me, um, talking about those things in Ukrainian, it's actually easier when I try to talk about that in English, uh, which is not my native language, it's kind of more difficult. So I would like to use this uh, opportunity to speak Ukrainian. So a few words about our conference, we're not conducting for the first time, of course, but last time and this time the Commons Journal Editorial Board decided to organize this conference as part of our project, the intersections of peripheries. Um, so the main goal of that is to build the relationships with uh, the participants, the actors of the global south and uh, from a wider context as well. Because as we feel, as we understand uh, in this kind of time, this is actually a very important task. We should have started to uh, do it even earlier, of course. But we have what we have. So last year we conducted a conference. This um, year we changed the, the topics that we focus on a bit. We're going to discuss justice and fairness, uh, climate justice and related questions. We're going to talk about um, higher educational institutions and uh, how they are affected by neoliberal reforms and how we learn about four, how our knowledge about four is uh, shaped and formed. So our panel on uh, this one, the first today, is dedicated to fairness and justice in the time of war and emergency. We are talking here about states of emergency because our feeling is that um, this kind of external violence uh, which is brought by the war but also by other disasters and um, uh, they include, of course, natural disasters. So how generally we came upon the idea for this panel, um, it emerged quite naturally, quite organically, as we observed the effects of war on all aspects of our life, um, including justice. So intuitively, we understand that something has to be transformed and changed in how we understand and achieve justice through institutions. But historically in Ukraine, it's quite difficult, has been and continues to be quite difficult to talk about legal matters because people tend to, to differentiate between the judicial system, the court system, this is one aspect, one sphere, and then social relations, this seems to be a different sphere. So legal matters and justice and rule of law, this is kind of one thing, one aspect, and then your usual everyday ordinary life, this is something different. But in the times of war and imagine those aspects become more intertwined because the need for justice and the presence of injustice are more clearly uh, overtly felt. This is at least my subjective experience, but also I know the experience of other people. At the start of the full-scale invasion, I did a study on uh, actually um, the judicial branch, the experience of judges, um, the professional experience, and what I was surprised by um, as a result of that research and what also calmed me down a bit, I saw that not a lot changed in the sphere of justice, now a judicial sphere. At least that was my impression during the first year of the full-scale invasion into Ukraine. And this was both shocking and uh, calming because the feeling was uh, with the full scale invasion, it's not quite clear whether the judicial branch will continue to exist and how this court system will continue to exist, but it did uh, persevere, it did uh, continue to exist. Uh, another matter that I focused on was how judges for themselves uh, actually formulate the idea of justice. And if you ask someone what justice is, um, from their perspective, the most honest answer you would get is, I don't know. And we can discuss that at length, of course, but 
Clearly, he cannot define justice in just a couple of sentences. Uh, judges tried to avoid that. They tried to explain what justice is by referencing what injustice is. Another topic that I would like to maybe focus on today is the um, correlation between uh, what's just uh, and what's legal. When I asked uh, my respondents, uh, judges about that, um, it seems uh, to you like there should be some kind of harmony because between those two ideas, everything that's just should be legal and vice versa. But actually, we see a more complicated kind of relationship between those two terms. So these are, I guess, my introductory remarks, my thoughts on what this panel started from, uh, what was the origin of our uh, discussion today. It would be very interesting for us to talk to our speakers about how they see the role of justice during the war, how this role changes, how this demand for justice is shaped and formed. Today we have with us um, three uh, no, actually four speakers. I will probably introduce all of you and then we will give our speakers 10 to 15 minutes each for their introductory remarks and then we'll have some space for interacting answers, questions um, regarding topics that interest us most. First of all, we're going to talk to Grana uh, Minrevich. She is, so Gorana is uh, quite closely connected to Ukraine and what's going on here. She is keeping in touch with Ukrainian feminists. She is a feminist herself, a human rights defender and an independent researcher on post-war issues and experiences affecting women in uh, Bosnia and um, Herzegovina and generally in the region uh, of former Yugoslavia. We hope uh, to hear from Karana um, more about the feminist critique uh, of the global system of justice and about this mismatch, this gap between the national and international context, uh, whether uh, the relationship between those levels is working well. And then we have with us uh, also um, Kiran Greivall, um, she's also an activist and a scholar uh, working and living right now in Sri Lanka. Um, she's a lawyer by education, but specializes now most of all on the exploration of uh, how war affects um, marginalized people, vulnerable people and how those categories of people seek peace and justice and fairness and um, the protection of their rights. We also have with us Oksana Pokarchuk. She is um, she has a PhD in law, and she is one of the co-executive directors of the Truth Hounds organization, which is an organization uh, specializing in documenting war crimes. Today, Oksana, as well as Karana, is focusing a lot on um, conflict-related sexual violence, and also, she is uh, researching and um, advocating for the justice mechanisms which have been established in Ukraine um, and which could be further developed. And then we have with us uh, Elia Ayub, a researcher, a writer, a journalist, and uh, one of the founders of the uh, Fire These Times podcast. And, um, co-founder of the from the periphery media collective so i would like to give uh, karana um, the floor to start our conversation karana the floor is yours for the introductory remarks thank you maria i'll try to kind of sum up and kind of say a couple of things in 10 minutes and yeah uh first of all just kind of because you already asked in a conversation uh in the email 
communication to reflect on how we kind of started dealing with this issue. Uh, first of all, um, kind of surviving the war and then come, I mean, and also coming afterwards, looking into the interventions, have, what have been done, what has been done in post-war Bosnia, I started kind of exploring more using feminist curiosity and asking different questions on what does justice mean for survivors. Uh, and in this context, as a feminist, and because uh, at that point in the 90s, there was an opening to address uh, wartime uh, rape as a something uh, that was invisible during previous uh, previous war, or not invisible in 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 that form, but rather uh, it wasn't uh, it was it wasn't made prosecutable. Quite a lot of energy feminists spent in nineties to actually not only <clears throat> not only talk about the that war affects women, but because that. The crimes are there were there were crimes that were perpetrated against women and uh, there was an opening and I can kind of reflect later on why that why that opening came around uh, was around uh, a question of rape uh, and uh, at that point of time it was quite a lot of energy spent in nineties and even to two thousand first of all to push for establishment of the International Criminal Tribunal for the changes in the procedures uh, within the court, uh, within international courtroom, but also later in the national courtroom. And then to make, to prove that a wartime rape can be prosecuted. And from that perspective, I ask, uh, I started asking myself, okay, uh, this all energy was spent on that. What does it mean for survivors? Uh, in the sense that uh, after, and I'm talking after the war, I can later reflect on the kind of uh, justice around and work of justice during the armed conflict or war or, or time of emergency. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, but at this point of time, I, I'm just going to talk about post kind of uh, post war realities. Uh, so my question was, what does it mean for survivors? In context of Bosnia, a lot of energy, lots of money was and uh, was was spent on first uh, capturing uh, capturing those per, uh, I mean capturing perpetrators, but only high ranked perpetrators uh, to bring and bring them to the international uh, courtroom. International courtroom was in The Hague, so far away from the country. So the first importance was that it was a distant. The justice through the accountability mechanism was distant for, for the uh, communities affected. So that played a role in the kind of, uh, in within the society, in the way how, the, how that was seen. Uh, majority of the uh, survivors that were affected were living in a poverty. Those brought to justice, in that sense of justice, legal justice, were actually seen and sitting in The Hague, where all the kind of, because of the requirements of the treatment of the prisoners, looked like they were better off in prisons than uh, a lot of, uh, than lots of survivors uh, living in the country. So that was the first thing that kind of triggered my thinking about what does justice mean? Uh, it was the question of, okay, there are purpose. And the second question is, when we talk about mass, uh, when we talk about war, we talk about mass crime and mass atrocity, mass violence. So what does that mean in the sense of focusing all energy on the prosecutions? And I'm not saying that prosecutions uh, shouldn't be done. They have to be done because accountability is important and it is important for the survivors, but that's not justice. I mean, I'm just sort of per a perception of the justice for the survivors. The second part uh, was that, okay, when the uh, mass atrocities are committed, there are mass perpetrators. Who are the perpetrators that are going to be brought before the courts and who are not? Uh, at the beginning, it was the, I mean, the, uh, 
because during the war, there were already some of the persecutions for war crimes within country, but because of the international community taking over those persecutions, there was a freeze and there was a stop on the persecutions within the country because the question was, uh, because of the guarantees of fair trial. So at the first time, at the first stop, it was only international community, but that costs, that costs a lot. So at some point of time, it was kind of concluded, no, we can't perpetrate, uh, we can't prosecute many. So we can only do the symbolic action of uh, prosecuting the higher ranked ones, the, the most responsible ones. Then there was a process of kind of uh, transferring the cases to the national courts and kind of, again, spending quite lots of money to the national courts to be able to prosecute in accordance with the national standards. And to, to acknowledge this, it was really success because significant number of perpetrators have been tried. It's I mean, when we talk about persecutions of rape, Bosnia is the country with significant number of perpetrators punished. The problem is, what does, I mean, the problem is that that's not sufficient and that that's not all when we talk about justice that needs to be considered. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not going to criticize now the problems within the uh, within the persecutions because there were problems with the persecution, including the question of the uh, penalties in a sense of how much uh, how many years of jail it was assigned. But that's that's another discussion. I'm talking about kind of I'm trying to talk about justice. So what does that all mean for the survivors? Another thing that we kind of keep perceiving and keep uh, forgetting in this uh, discussion is when we talk about, uh, for example, focus on the issue of rape. Uh, in, a, in a situation of war, rape is just uh, another crime survived by survivors. And we keep forgetting that, we keep focusing only, and this is uncomfortable truth that I have to say, but we keep focusing on only one crime survived. We put survivors in the box. Each survivor, and when I'm talking about different crimes, forced displacement is a crime. Camp imprisonment is a crime. Uh, living under shells is a crime. So we can, uh, starvation is a crime. Uh, work, uh, living under siege is a crime. So there are segments of uh, relatives of these, uh, of survivors have been killed. So they might actually perceive that that's more important trauma than the, uh, and the only justice, the only way that they can actually achieve justice is through one single crime. So we make, uh, by focusing only and exclusively on one experience, there is, a, we also make a problem for survivors. Uh, we folk, I mean, there is, and this is again, not to kind of minimize that, the feminist in the 90s insisted, but that was the only opening. We could, we never talked about other gender crimes. We never had a chance to talk about other gender crimes. We never had a chance to talk about what does it mean for uh, survivors of rape to actually survive also uh, camp imprisonment. We never, I mean, it was, it, it is a building of different harms. We kind of decided because the law, and this is the, because of the logic of law, decided that somehow all the experiences are homogenous and they are not. Everyone kind of has different perception of what what the survivor of us, uh, what the survivor of war, uh, surviving the war, including rape means. Uh, the problem why I said, uh, the problem that we created is that victims uh, or survivors can only claim certain benefits, I mean, certain uh, reparations only through one specific, uh, specifically understood survive, uh, experience, surviving of a specific crime. Even though they have been, uh, they have had so many different, I mean, different crime, first experiences of different crime. There is another level of uh, to that. Uh, 
and I mentioned it question of economic and social justice, for example, being one of those uh, unaddressed harm of that crime throughout the years changes and changes in such a way that might actually add up, uh, different harms. And I'm trying to say this, for example, I try to illustrate not to kind of generalize. Uh, for example, if women survived rape, and then we kind of marked, I mean, we kind of, this, as we as a society decided that's her only, uh, only experience of war, and then pushed on her, for example, the ideas of stigma, the ideas of shame, the ideas of she uh, she then gets another i mean she then survives another harm which is either uh, uh either something that kind of she is not able to kind of go outside talk to someone there is a possibility of interrupted education because of that there is i mean and it because of the war as well there is another i mean another level of uh, harm that might be question around uh around uh for example i'm sorry uh, uh, she, sorry i just want to kind of so there is a shame she doesn't go out she misses uh, education education miseducation means uh, less pro, uh, less chances to actually integrate in the society workforce so we are having piling up of the harms and that that's a one thing without being able to address them the second the second part is uh, that treating women as that they are homogenous group is also uh, perpetrating additional additional uh, additional um, how would I, additional burden on them because th there was there is only ex one experience that is criminalized that they understand as being criminalized that they understand being able to, to receive reparations. And given the interventions that have been kind of uh, in recent year, uh, been done through this different international communities, it's the only way that to achieve some economic justice. So I'm just going to inter, uh, sort of in, uh, uh, interpret this because suddenly, uh, and it's not suddenly, but last, 15 years uh, plus years because governments decided that uh, and because of the uh, some of the UN resolutions, women, peace and securities, it was important to focus on uh, rape. Governments it, uh, decided to channel the money into that. Channeling the money, unfortunately, is not to listen to the survivors, what they are talking about, but it is to get, I mean, it is the kind of something to for different uh, service providers to live off it's it is something uh so they there is only one form uh, force a uh, form to address survivors experience it's a psychosocial therapy it's the economic empowerment in a sense that women have been given uh cows or the greenhouses and nothing else. They just go through that. And I've been having the discussion with so many different women saying they made us, uh, they made us, uh, they made us kind of producers of food without even thinking and considering what we wanted really. Uh, and that's kind of the, the form that the, the women are forced into as uh, because as addressing and understanding kind of the harms uh, without proper understanding the harms and with fa focusing only exclusively in one segment of their life and i'm gonna stop because i just made it more complicated than than i should uh but i can actually justify and uh, kind of explain more uh, later uh, thank you Karan, very much uh so uh kiran uh please sir Thank you, um, and thank you, Gorana. Um, I think you've kind of laid the groundwork for some of the things I also wanted to say. Um, I'm gonna try not to take too much time because I'm very conscious that actually of all of the panelists, I'm the one who ha 
actually hasn't lived what it means to to be in a war context. Um, so, you know, my reflections are very much as somebody who has spent time studying these things. And, and now, you know, I've been working in Sri Lanka for the last 12, 13 years. Um, but I, I think that, you know, I'm still coming at it from a little bit of a distance. Um, but I mean, just to sort of start off, uh, you know, I kind of came to the question of international justice um, very naively, I would say, um, very much from the point of view of an international feminist lawyer um, who, you know, came into this thinking, you know, post the, the kind of 1990s um, excitement that, you know, we were developing this area of international criminal justice um, and, uh, you know, the, the kind of mobilization of the feminist movement to say, we think that we can do something really productive with this. Um, and so it was with that kind of enthusiasm that I started to get involved in this work. And I think what Gorana has laid out for you in, you know, detail about the specificity in, in Bosnia is something that will resonate for many people who've looked at, at how international justice has played out across different contexts. So, I mean, while I was at Amnesty, I worked on Kosovo, then I was in um, Sierra Leone monitoring the war crimes trials there. Um, and then subsequently I've worked in Nepal and Sri Lanka. And I think what we have seen repeatedly is that far from international justice representing a kind of, uh, you know, a break with the limits of justice in peacetime or like, you know, in the normal time, we see the same kinds of problems being reproduced. So, you know, I think one of the things that for many of us as feminists engaging with international law, I think we've been a little bit chastened because we think that, you know, why would we think when we have all these issues with prosecuting sexual violence at the national level and at domestic levels, why would we think suddenly those problems are going to go away once we move into the international realm? So what we've seen is, you know, and um, Gorana and my close friend and colleague, Kirsten Campbell has documented this in relation to the ICTY. And, you know, I've seen this in other settings as well, that, you know, the, the kind of problems, the limits of formal justice systems do not go away when we introduce international justice as opposed to domestic justice. So that would be the first thing I would want to say. The other thing I would say is on top of that, I think we have a, a problem that sometimes justice as it's invoked in emergency or um, conflict or extraordinary circumstances can actually intentionally or unintentionally help legitimate and reinforce the peacetime status quo. So, I mean, Goran has spoken a lot about, you know, how rape as a weapon of war was, you know, for many of us feminists from the, the 90s and early 2000s, we saw it as a victory when we, we got, you know, the first prosecutions for rape as an international crime. But you know, one of the things that I started to, to get more and more concerned by was the ways in which once rape as a weapon of war gets taken up within a legal framework that is inherently quite patriarchal and conservative, you see a kind of reproduction of the same problems that feminists had pointed to about rape in domestic contexts, where you have like real rape is when it's strangers, when it's in a dark alley, real rape isn't when it's, you know, your husband or in the family or, and and so then you have start to have this kind of exceptionality of rape as a weapon of war when it's used by an enemy soldier against this community. And then the harm starts to be defined as the attack on the community and, and the harm that's done to a community. And while I, you know, I think we can see in many contexts that's true that communities, that this has been used as a weapon to try and harm communities. Often that's because of the patriarchal assumptions that are made about women's bodies. And so, you know, then where does women's autonomy and where do, do the experiences of women go in this situation? Not to mention then, you know, how do we see sexual violence more broadly? 
where is the space then why you know it's not accidental that then you know sexual violence committed against men or committed against women within their own communities or all of these crimes then sort of have to be ignored because they don't fit the frame of what it is that we're supposed to be punishing and you know another example so rape was one example i can give you another example is in sierra leone uh, one of the things that feminists were very excited about um, was that the special court for Sierra Leone prosecuted forced marriage as a crime against humanity. But what we saw in those prosecutions was a distinction being drawn between peacetime marriage, which was not seen as ever, uh, you know, oppressive in any way, uh, that was seen as a good for the society. And then, you know, rate, uh, then marriage within wartime as you know, because it was rebel soldiers taking women, not paying doubt, you know, the bride price they were supposed to pay, not taking the the um, consent of the father, that that becomes a harm. And so actually what you see there is a kind of shoring up of, of this ideal image of marriage that, again, you know, feminists across the world have called into question repeatedly. So, you know, I think for, for a number of us, we became concerned that actually once you enter these spaces of formal justice systems while we may push these agendas because we have a kind of progressive politics in mind how formal justice systems without necessarily taking on the progressive ideas how they will interpret and prosecute doesn't necessarily lead to progressive outcomes and then I guess, you know, the other thing that I would want to add, and, you know, I'm very interested to hear how people, particularly um, people it, looking at the conflicts that we're currently facing in the world, how this relates to you. You know, the problem is on top of the reinforcement of status quo of, you know, gender relations or other types of relations, class relations, you know, and, and it can be a kind of range of different hierarchical relations. We also, when we have the international justice agenda coming in, there's also the risk of reproducing imperialist and racist high, global hierarchies, like civilizational hierarchies. And, you know, the reason why I kind of invoke this now is I think, you know, we're already seeing this in relation to, to Palestine, you know, where there are kind of clear hierarchies of well, you know, these are the people who are more civilized, these are the people who are less civilized. How does that then get reproduced in international justice? Does it actually get um, countered or does it actually get produced again? So I guess, you know, my kind of um, disillusionment with the international justice has led me to think much more about how do we recognize the continuums of violence that span before the conflict, into conflict and post-conflict? And how do we capture those in our attempts to use any kind of conflict-related justice mechanism? Is there space for us to recognize that, you know, sexual violence or torture is the other thing I've worked a lot on. You know, when when torture happens in in a, in a situation of, you know, wars on terror or are in states of emergency or armed conflict, how do they relate to other practices that that were already there, that, that are maybe, you know, made more visible, made more violent in that particular emergency situation, but that have roots that make them possible to people from peacetime as well. And then, I mean, I guess, you know, Gorana also asked this question of when we think about trials and um, you know, and accountability mechanisms. Who, on the one hand, you know, as she's saying, and I agree with her, you know, there, this, the feeling that there needs to be some accountability is, is often felt. I mean, one of the things living in Sri Lanka and, you know, Sri Lanka is now, what, 15 years post, post-war, um, the, the lack of any sense of accountability is, is a, a wound that doesn't heal. I mean, we've just we've just had elections here in Sri Lanka. People are very excited because for the first time we have a kind of shift in the politics that's not just divided across along ethnic lines, but still the test will be whether or not 
the new government actually is willing to begin a conversation about accountability because without it you the idea that you can build a kind of reconciliation i think is always going to be fairly superficial so i agree with you warren i think that that question of accountability is always there but also as you pointed out what justice means is often beyond the accountability question and so then the question of whose interests get served when particular types of processes, accountability processes are invoked is a kind of ongoing question. Um, and so, you know, this has really taken me, uh, having said that I don't want to speak for too long, and now I'm going to try and wrap up quickly. Um, so, I mean, where that's taken me in my own work over the last 12, 13 years in Sri Lanka is to think about what justice means beyond law and beyond the formal institutions. Um, and, you know, particularly so, for example, Sri Lanka has a huge problem of disappearance. I mean, a, a long history of um, mass disappearance, uh, actually going across different types of conflict and across different communities. And, you know, I think one of the, th the questions that the families of the disappeared movement constantly ask us is what does justice look like in a situation that can actually never really be resolved? I mean, the you know, the reality is that while, of course, the families of the disappeared will continue to say they want their loved ones back. But we also know that the loved ones are not coming back. And so when that and, and also even in terms of knowing the details of what happened, in many cases, those details will never be known. So when there is a situation that cannot ever be repaired, there is no there is no solution to this. What would justice mean then? How do we deal with that? And this is where I think that sometimes, you know, the, the kind of focus on, on very narrow legalistic accounts of justice, they, they can only ever deliver part of, part of what people need. And so the kind of question, the broader question of, of how people come to terms with that, how they hold the state accountable for that, beyond just holding individual perpetrators to, to account, but actually the state as a whole, the society as a whole, to account for that past. And how we think about what the society has to look like afterwards, those are things that formal legal justice are not going to be able to do. And, you know, I guess just to sort of conclude, I would say, um, you know, I think that um, there are ways in which law and formal justice processes can be used and are used often um, in very strategic and creative ways by survivors, often not in the ways that lawyers think that they're doing good, but actually, you know, the ways in which survivors use this as a place to tell their stories or, and often within very limited frames. And that's the kind of violence of the legal frame that, you know, they don't get to tell the kind of fullness of their story. Um, but also, you know, I, I don't underestimate the extent to which um, marginalized communities are able to mobilize the language of law and particularly international law to push back against the, the processes within their societies that try and shut them down and dominate them. So I, while I have been completely disillusioned with law, I've kind of come back around, um, but not in terms of, I think that we need to break the stranglehold of, of lawyers thinking that you know, they are the ones who are delivering justice to communities. And I think we need to recognize that justice does extend beyond the formal institutions. And a lot of work has to happen beyond those spaces. But also to recognize that many times marginalized people in various contexts will turn to the language of law as an ally, as a, as a powerful legitimator of the claims that they're trying to make. And so I think, you know, for those of us who care about marginalized populations, both in conflict and post-conflict, I think recognizing um, and, and working on how we act in solidarity with those efforts is for me, a more important part of the justice process than just continuing to invest in the formal justice system. I had a lot more things to say, but the time goes very quickly. So I want to stop now. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Karen. Really inspired uh, uh, 
notes, introductory notes. Uh, so now, Oksana, please, uh, your, your time. Uh, thank you very much. I will be speaking in Ukrainian. So I would like to suggest you to use interpretation function if you need it. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today with this important and difficult topic. I'm working in quite a deep way with these issues and I've been looking at this. Uh, I watched again and again how emergency change not for communities but also understanding of justice. My path in this field began as a lawyer at the Ukrainian NGO dealing with LGBTQI and women's rights and later at the European Court of Human Rights where I dealt with cases of people seeking justice in incredibly difficult circumstances. Later I worked at Amnesty International and this experience gave me the opportunity to expand my personal perception and understanding of the concept of justice to see the depths that was simply inaccessible to me than a young lawyer. This experience shaped my understanding of justice, not as a distant ideal, but as a vital necessity in the face of violence and loss. In war torn communities, the need for justice is now becoming more urgent and palpable. And when we talk about justice, it is not only about punishing the guilty, because often when we talk about justice, we win court decisions. But I want to emphasize that justice is much more. In addition to, to court decisions, I want to say that it's really much more. It's a huge addition to court decision. But I want to talk about three other important aspects of justice. It's about restoration of trust, acknowledgement of harm, and restoration of lost dignity. I would like to say that existing justice systems are often unable to meet these needs, showing gaps in accessibility, speed, and relevance. Moreover, governmental approaches to justice are mostly focused on judicial decisions, which, I emphasize, remain very critically important, but at the same time, other forms of immoralization and search for relevant forms of justice to various communities, they are almost not developing. My experience working with poor affected communities has shown that justice is not only about holding the perpetrators accountable, although it is extremely important, but also about giving the victims, the families of the victims, the opportunity to regain their voice and recover and make visible their own history. However, national systems often do not respond to these needs, leaving the space for the work of international mechanisms or non-governmental organizations, which is obviously insufficient. Speaking of needs, I remember many stories, and each one is unique and it is unique to all of us that work with victims who are affected groups. These uh, stories live in our souls. They're actually unique. In one city that was destroyed by bombs, many people were killed and they disappeared. When I spoke to those people from that community, they said that there was an urgent need to establish who exactly dropped those bombs. That is, official, investigative judicial part is extremely important, it's primary. But at the same time, there is an urgent need to create a place of memory for the disappeared, a place where relatives can come those relatives of those killed and missing and leave their loss there because there are such places of memory in fact but they suffer from weather the wind they're not official they also lack attention of people outside the family and relatives of the victims i often can hear 
when I come back to the city. But not only there, in fact, that there is the need to include these stories in local educational programs, curriculums, to preserve the memory for the children, to tell it to the children for future generations to remember and thus to acknowledge what happened for this not to disappear. In another case that I can remember, a victim of sexualized torture needed psychological assistance and it was the only thing they actually needed to move on in their life. I remember a group of men who needed specific operations, medical operations available not only in one part of the country. And there are such needs that are very difficult and it is not uh, NGOs that can satisfy systemically all these needs. We should say that justice systems do not exist in vacuum. They are deeply rooted in social relations. For example, national systems should focus on building trust with victims and victims' families. It doesn't exist as of today. Social norms play a significant role in shaping justice-seeking behavior. For example, victims of sexualized violence, mostly women, often face stigma. We spoke about that. And this discourages them from seeking justice which results in more problems. That is why our work includes not only documenting crimes, but also advocating based on experience, based on other conflicts, based on other, on the experience of, of uh, other feminists. We are advocating for systemic changes that would overcome the societal barriers. But it's very difficult. So, back to needs. In many places, there is no access to doctors or quality food, so people are forced to plant gardens literally under fire. No work, no hope for a better life. But there is one common need throughout Ukraine that was under occupation. It's the fear of new occupation. Most people who survived the occupation say that our main need is not to be occupied again. Thus, need, needs are extremely different, in fact, in Ukraine. And we must approach the analysis and to satisfy the needs individually. That is, we should work with care, caution and respect. Let me also speak about justice. The state of emergency further complicates these dynamics of justice. Emergency laws often put security ahead of justice, ahead of anything which can undermine legal safeguarding. For example, in Ukraine, expedited trials are sometimes a necessity, but at the same time, they can jeopardize the principles of fairness and due procedure. These challenges highlight the need for balance so that justice does not fall prey to haste. In conclusion, I want to say my views on justice were formed through work with victims, victims' families, lawyers and politicians. And as a result of uh, this many years of work, I have come to see justice as a journey, not a final destination goal a process that must adapt to changes in the realities of war, post-war and other emergencies. While the gaps in our systems may seem overwhelming, they also open up opportunities for innovation. We must implement restorative justice practices, strengthen links between local and international mechanisms and prioritize the existing ex experience that we can take from other places. We should prioritize voices of those most affected by violence. In conclusion, I believe that justice in war is not only about legal outcomes, of course they are important, but still about healing, accountability and collective work to rebuild what was destroyed. Thank you.
Hvala vam dakle za vašu promovu. Uh, Thank you very much for speaker, your speech, for your presentation. And Elia, our last speaker, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Good. Um, yeah, I wanted to reflect on one of the questions that we got before by email. How does the possibility and impossibility of punishing uh, work criminals, collaborators and others affect affected communities, so like victimized communities? And I think we sp we saw a lot in the three previous presentations. A, I saw a lot of parallels to my own context of Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon is often compared to Bosnia for different reasons. Um, I do think also there are parallels with Sri Lanka for that matter. And what's kind of interesting and at the same time also very disheartening about the case of Lebanon is that Lebanon kind of went through a, a much clearer or simpler path, if you want to put it that way, in a post-war, which is that the people who committed the war crimes uh, basically got together with an international consensus. So the Americans, the Syrians, especially and the Israelis at the time and others, big powers, and agreed to simply pass an amnesty law. So the amnesty law quite literally forgave uh, the vast majority of crimes that were committed before 1991. Uh, with the exception, notably, and this is where you get the hierarchy of who counts as a victim in the first place, uh, uh, if you had uh, murdered a, a uh, religious figure of prominence or a political figure of prominence, in which case you would be exempted from the amnesty law. So already we saw with the ratification of the amnesty law, who get to count as a victim and who doesn't. It was heavily gendered. All of the exceptions were for men of power. Um, obviously, the vast majority of cases, whether it's torture, mass rape, displacement, uh, enforced disappearances, were effectively, quote unquote, forgiven as far as the law was concerned. So what we ended up happening after, as of the 90s, the civil wars from 75 to 1990, so effectively but the past three or so decades, is that the very same people who uh, were the primary actors during the civil war basically inherited the post-war. And they became the, I, I described it once as like the act, the agents of war became the de facto agents of peace. By which I meant that like, they got to decide effectively when war would be uh, enacted upon the, the people of Lebanon, not just Lebanese, but non-Lebanese as well. And when not, they would come every now and then, every few months at times, every few years at times. Um, and say things like, if we are not careful, if we don't calm down, etc., etc., we risk a civil war. As if they are not the only ones who can enact that civil war. It was a way, of course, of having, of threatening their opponents, usually independents, activists, uh, civil society folks, and whatnot. Um, so the amnesty law sort of made it clearer in many ways from the very beginning. The post-war would only be possible if you, the victim, uh, which Lebanon is a very small country, so the victims could really mean even a majority of the of the country, depending on how one would define it. Well, obviously, if you're a victim of enforced disappearance, that's pretty straightforward. But if you're a relative of someone who was forcibly disappeared, you're also a victim. If you're forcibly displaced, uh, the vast majority of people were never allowed to go back to the places where they where they came from originally. Of course, southern Lebanon was occupied by the Israelis until the year 2000, so 10 years after the post-war supposedly started, there was still a military occupation, as well as the Syrian regime until 2005, so in the rest of the country, I mean. So the very concept of the post-war uh, is something that, in the case of Lebanon, um, can and I think should be very heavily problematized. Um, how does this affect the victimized communities? And I, I, again, in the case of Lebanon, it's it's a bit difficult to even narrow it down because you can really speak about the majority of the population. And this isn't even including the recent events since September with the, the ongoing war between Israel and Hezbollah, which has displaced over a million and a half people in Southern Lebanon in a country, from Southern Lebanon, sorry, in a country of like five to six million. So we're really talking about the majority of the population in one way or another has been impacted by state or non-state violence in a pretty significant manner, often more than once. Uh, most people um, who were internally displaced in the past few months alone have been displaced more than once um, because of the, the specific nature of how, how the areas are targeted. Um, they forcibly disappeared during the civil war. I, I study something called hauntology. It's a very niche field within cultural studies. 
have effectively become hauntings, have ghosts, as as it's it's called. It can be used in a problematic term because you can remove agency by by using the term ghost as if they're not there anymore and whatnot. And of course, those who are forcibly disappeared in many in many ways are not there. They're assumed to be dead. In fact, the Lebanese state has decided to declare them dead uh, two decades ago. And so if you're a relative of someone who has forcibly disappeared, the only two options you've had are you accept it and you basically shut up about it. You've eff effectively been told in those specific terms, like stop talking about it, or you try and do something about it. And that's what the committee of the families of the disappeared, as they're called in English, have tried to do for over three decades now, in some cases over four decades, because the the war, as I said, was between the 75 and 1990s. So in some cases, it goes back to the 70s. Many parents and relatives of those who have forcibly disappeared have themselves passed away since. And what's kind of um, more kind of, again, interesting slash disheartening for the, the specific context of this conversation is that those committees have then kind of joined in many ways other committees. So since the, the Port of Beirut explosion in 2020, there was another committee that was formed, again, of relatives of the families of those who were killed, who died in that explosion. Uh, and the cycle of, immu of Im impunity, sorry, continues because it was embedded in the very structure of post-war Lebanon. So in many ways, we can't even speak of a post-war without speak, in the case of Lebanon, I mean, without speaking of a uh, of impunity. The two came together because it was embedded in the structure of what ended officially the civil war. And so that put people, civilians, ordinary folks, in a very difficult situation because you had the option between accepting injustice or risking civil war. And those were the only two options presented to you. And those, to this day, are still the only two options presented to you with this more international dimension, because it includes, of course, the Israeli state now. Well, it has for a long time, but especially in the past few months. Um, so what it does is that it creates a situation where the, the very, um, the very like this, even discursive or theoretical possibility of talking about justice in any context becomes impossible. It's, it's, it's almost like it's not worth engaging with because I'm not saying it's not, I'm saying it's, it, it, it is rendered that way. Uh, of course, I wouldn't believe, I wouldn't ever accept that it's not. Um, because we've had not just one cycle, but two, three, four, five, six onwards. And the context, the, the, what is called a post-war, again, in the case of Lebanon, I think has been part of that violence in the first place. Calling it post-war in the case of Lebanon has been part of that violence because it implies that we have moved beyond something very specific, very concrete. And yet, as I said, after the 90s, there was still a military occupation, 2005, as of 2005, there were car bomb assassinations and other types of assassinations against various political figures. 2006, you had a war between Israel and Hezbollah, 2008, a small mini civil war was actually called that in those terms, in that way, I mean, and then all of the events in the past decade, including obviously in the past year and especially in the past four months or so. So when did that post-war actually occur? And this, I'll end on this note. The temporality, I think, should be um, reversed, not reversed, but kind of problematized. And it's not just that there was something in the past and now we're in the future, like, oh, we have moved beyond that thing that's concretely in the past. It's more that in the case of Lebanon, you're always in between events of violence and you anticipate violence. And it's called the anticipation of violence in the literature. So we live when we live cases of quote unquote peace, i.e. that currently there is no violence. And however we want to define this, at least overt violence of the spectacular kind like war bombs and, and gun battles and so on. Uh, you live those days and weeks and months and in some cases, if you're lucky years with the anticipation that they're going to occur again. Now, I know this is very bleak. I apologize for, about this, but I think it's important to just recognize and I'll end, I will end on this specific note that this has only been been made possible through an international consensus. Lebanon was effectively sacrificed, if I use geopolitical terms here, from the early 90s. It was in the case of the first Gulf War, the Americans wanted to have the Syrian regime on its side, and Lebanon was sort of handed to Syria as, as kind of compensation, if you want, or as, as reward or whatever, with southern Lebanon handed over or continued to be under Israeli occupation. And this has continued to color to this day 
there's an ongoing war, a, a, in, in some cases, an ecocide in southern Lebanon, ethnic cleansing in southern Lebanon especially, and no one in Lebanon expects the Lebanese themselves to have any say in when it's going to stop, who is going to, on which conditions, on which terms. It is taken for granted within Lebanon, even by the, 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 the prime minister, the foreign minister, like high-ranking politicians, the way they talk to the population is that we went to the UN or we are speaking to the Americans and we're hoping that they say yes or we're negotiating on behalf, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's very much a position in which the people who supposedly represent the state are pretty much openly saying that they have no power in the matter. And maybe we can get into this more, but I don't want to take too much of my time. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, um, Grana would like to make a comment regarding impunity, and uh, actually we can make some like, circle if uh, someone wants uh, to add something. And also one uh, remind uh, for our listeners, you can put uh, questions in the chat. So, uh, yeah, please, Grana. I mean, just to reflect on both Kiran and Elia, uh, uh, regarding impunity slash question around accountability. When you were, I mean, yes, Bosnia is somehow used as example of existence of accountability, including both international justice system and uh, national justice system. And as I mentioned, there, there have significant number of uh, uh, perpetrators have been prosecuted, including some, uh, including some uh, leading uh, political and military leaders. But this does didn't end the feeling of impunity and lack of accountability. It is again the question of the who, and uh, as as Elia, Elia mentioned. Uh, what is the, I mean, what the game of the international community as well, whatever that international community, we still kind of wait who is going to be uh, arrested, who is going to be, I mean, we also have the question of constant fear of fear mongering uh, around the conflict, not as much as violent, I mean, because the, not mu as much of the constant violence, because I would say that Lebanese peace agreement was used as some form of kind of uh, template for Bosnia, but just uh, Lebanon 2.0 in a sense, just kind of improved. So some things were addressed uh, previously, but we still have become a geopolitical uh, game. And uh, in that sense, accountability was only to that level to just get an impression of it, but not really because uh, those that were actually part of the peace agreement, uh, war and peace agreement and creators of violence are still uh, in power. So just just for that. And that the question of accountability, the constant, the constant, uh, there is a kind of, feeling that there is no accountability and this implies now in a peacetime as well so there's not much accountability during the wartime or there was but symbolic one and that translates now into a so-called peacetime or post peace agreement time where accountability is almost non-existent especially for those ones in uh, power Um, Elia, go ahead with... Uh, oh, just very quickly, um, Bosnia and Lebanon are interesting cases to study in comparison with one another in that, in, in that way. And I, I, I had a conversation with Ida Hozic, who is originally from Bosnia, on, on, on the podcast a few, a few months ago, uh, sorry, a few years ago. The reason I, I, I bring it up specifically is because even in the case of Bosnia, as you've mentioned, there was a, in many ways an internationalization of uh, which you've, I've read one of your pieces on, I think Kosovo 2.0, 2 uh, on, on basically a form of neocolonialism, that there are foreign powers right now, the Germans come to mind especially, that get a, have a high say, a, a lot of say in what occurs in Bosnia, like what happens, its foreign policy, uh, its future, as its existence as a state for that matter. And 
it's important to to kind of name it the way it is because for the most part the people who participated in whether it's a tariff agreement in the case of Lebanon or the Dayton Accord in the case of Bosnia uh, have used those sto- story or those case studies if you want as 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 templates to replicate elsewhere it's very self congratulatory tone um, of like at least we have stopped the bloodshed and 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 whatnot and it's used in many ways the the something that's called a peace agreement in this very dystopian manner i suppose used to inflict violence on other uh, contexts other societies by by using this supposed uh, example of like you know this great thing that we have achieved i see the parallels between those two a lot Yeah, I also want, uh, as uh, Oksana said, uh, that a lot of, uh, like, we have uh, trials, and it's really important part of, uh, like, uh, justice, uh, uh, achieving justice. But at the same time, uh, like, during the war, we have these uh, threats of uh, actually unfair justice. And, uh, like, for example, we have some examples with uh, uh, club. Uh, um, crime collaboration crimes uh, yeah uh because like here a lot of people want to be like collaborator be punished uh, but uh, at the same time access to real collaborator who made decision etc cetera, etc cetera. it's like uh, quite, quite difficult so we uh, our like we cannot prosecute them because they just went uh and but they're ordinary people who just try to do something uh, on this uh, like occupied territory but there is like this demand for justice and i want to ask uh, if this uh, demand of justice uh, uh, can be damaged for community itself or it's more like a dangerous situation with impunity when we haven't this like punishment. So uh, I believe that it's not uh, like real comparable, like don't have or have too much, uh, but maybe we can like speculate a little bit about this. I can start and then, yeah. Uh, the first reflection is, uh, during the war, everything, all the norms have changed, including the demands for justice. That's, I mean, it's different from what would you expect and how you would actually approach question of justice uh, outside of the war context. Because, and when I'm talking about war, uh, I really specifically am talking about constant shelling and kind of no place to, I mean, because probably we can argue now that uh war i mean war is wa- wider and conflict is wider issue but, but uh so there are i mean even demands for justice are somehow obscured and this is kind of um i'm not 100% sure that, that the question that demands for that, I mean, demands for justice are not damaging, but the problem is what, I mean, how they are phrased. Let me put it that way. Because I can reflect on how I felt during the war under the siege and how kind of that even my thinking was different and was more militarized than thinking after, after the war, after the process of, I mean, after I started kind of nor... I can't say normal because you normalize life in in under the, uh, under the siege as well. But different, living differently, not having a uh, militarized militarized mindset, militarized life every day. So there, the demands change. So in that sense, I would argue that those demands at that point of time are more violent and can be can be tricky rather than i mean i'm not going to say damaging the problem is impunity and a lack of accountability has bigger influence on society uh, uh later on especially in the post war because it translates into something i don't uh, the po- uh, and i'll just finish here in bosnia do you, and i mentioned that during the war there were trials there were trials even for war crimes there were trials for different things that all was annulled 
with a peace agreement because every peace agreement or every conclusion of the of uh, of war somehow does bring some form of amnesty and does bring some form of uh, questioning uh, those pro uh, processes that were actually uh, violating human rights. And that can be included in the prosecutions without fair trial, but also, for example, in the occupied territories where people, I mean, and I'm talk talking for Bosnia, not for Ukraine, reflecting for Ukraine now, uh, occupied ter territories where people during the forced displacements were forced and had a court or uh, court cases that agreed to kind of exchange the property or give away property. That all was actually annulled to certain uh, certain period. Uh, so yeah, I'll stop. But an amnesty can be just defined differently. Uh, as Elia was Elia was saying regarding the problematic uh, ways of amnesty in the context of uh, of Lebanon. But then you can have amnesty for just people who were mobilized, uh, not for the perpetrators of the war crimes. Yeah, it's really, um, I'm quite amazed uh, with this uh, thought uh, that uh, justice uh, could be more violent during the war and different from like post-war time and like uh, you understand this uh, during war time but like still it um, like doesn't change a lot <laughs> because it's like just uh, uh, when like I, I can put it like this when words and your knowledge couldn't do um, with your feelings about justice it's uh, it's amazing in some way uh, Oksana? Yes, I would like to continue. So if we talk about collaborationism in terms of how this affects communities, I would look at the situation from the following point of view. If we answer directly and immediately the question of whether the desire for justice can exacerbate the situation, can make it worse, can it damage the community, I would say no. In response to that question, my answer would be no. If this demand comes from within the community and if this demand is met, is satisfied within the framework of how this community sees justice. So what do I mean? In Ukraine specifically, I think we are seeing a clash of two processes. On the one hand, we see a demand for justice coming from the community um, this grassroots uh, demand, for example, the community know who the real collaborators were, who did what. If you go to the occupied territories and you talk to people, um, this logic emerges in front of your eyes. You see it. And so you could build up um, this fair trial, this fair process of prosecution. The system and this demand and this logic that comes from the bottom-up clashes with the state uh, system of uh, establishing the guilty ones, naming the guilty ones and uh, looking for those who perpetrated crimes. So looking for collaborators, let's say. But the state system uses mechanisms that are not really feasible in real uh, cases of prosecution. What I mean by this practically is the following. A criminal case would not be opened against a real collaborator who supported the occupation authorities and helped them them, but instead uh, a criminal investigation, a criminal case would be opened against a teacher in a school, let's say, whom uh, the occupation authorities forced her to continue working in this school by threatening her with uh, murder, rape, or harming her family. So the system, this um, top 
bottom system from the state um, requires the use of uh, documents, legal documents, and relies on this use. So they have documents, decrees saying that this teacher was um, uh, sent to teach in this school, and so yes, this teacher um, is a collaborator, and so yes, this is what we are fighting against. But this system is not in touch with the needs and demands uh, that come from this grassroots level, and this leads uh, to frustration and disappointment um, in how this system of accountability and justice is seen by communities in Ukraine. So this is what we're trying to deal with and to cope with. And of course, Ukraine is a vast territory um, with different communities um, and uh, the state authorities tell us, okay, so um, which uh, mechanism, which approach would you choose? And uh, our response is it's really impossible to choose one approach that fits all. Every time you are looking at this on a case by case basis, you analyze the situation on the ground, you look for the demand uh, which uh, comes um, from this that particular community. As Kiran said uh, quite rightly, very often you see the system imposed on marginalized communities that does not really correspond to what they need and want. Thank you for your comment. Uh, yeah, I believe um, I also really um... Like, I think a lot about this language of law and form of law. And Grana said about, like, this logic of law uh, in terms of, uh, like, types and, like, trying to shape. And uh, it, what you said about, uh, like, this knowledge which uh, community has, but uh, which couldn't be counted by formal justice. Um, I believe that uh, it's really important, uh, like, uh, not only for wartime justice, but uh, also for justice at all, and justice in like in in our time. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, like Ran, do you want to add something, uh, or I can put like uh, uh, Kiran? Um, no, I mean I think I think both Gorana and Oksana captured a lot of what I would say. I mean I think mm -hmm. one of the the observations I have of speaking to people who you know obviously still want some sense of of accountability justice whatever we call it is that sometimes the focus on a legal process it it narrows the frame of you know this is it, it's hard I'm, I'm hesitating to say it because I agree with what you're saying, Oksana, that, you know, ultimately we have to do it from the perspective of what of what survivors want. But one of the conversations that, you know, I've had with um, survivors is, you know, when they say to me, well, do you think there will ever be, you know, will international justice ever deliver something to us? And I have increasingly decided to to be very honest and say, no, I don't think it will. And it and I say that one, because, you know, in the case of Sri Lanka, it will never be a, a priority for the international community. This is not a place that, you know, what Elia was saying and, you know, we can see how this plays out. I mean, I'm sure for you Ukrainians, you know, you're very conscious of this as well. Like what are the kind of geopolitical investments in particular justice projects? So Sri Lanka doesn't doesn't fit those. So in terms of an, a kind of international community response, it, if it didn't happen in 2009, it's not going to happen now. Um, but also, you know, I, I keep saying to, to survivors that actually I think, you know, when, when we look at what they have achieved, like how they have made sense of the situation, the ways in which they've tried to rebuild their lives and communities, the you know, all of the, the kind of processes they themselves have been through, I keep saying to them, don't underestimate the power of that and don't expect that this international justice process is going to give you something that you actually haven't already found for yourselves. Um, and, you know, and, and I mean, on the question of collaboration, you know, it's, it, my friend is an artist and he did an exhibition um, a few years ago um, in his home village 
and it was in a bombed out house that he remembers as a child that they used to hide in and a lot of the village community came to the exhibition and one of the big reflections that people had during that was I mean the reason he did it in the village was because he said he wanted his art to be a place where the community could actually talk about the things that had happened when they had been silenced for so long and it did it created a lot of conversation. And it was very interesting that actually the people, like you know, this is now, you know, so the exhibition happened uh, maybe five years ago. So it was already sort of 10 years on. And actually the events that they were talking about were sort of 15, 20 years on. And you know, the people that they still felt the angriest about were not the, the government soldiers who came and, and committed atrocities. It was the people in the village who handed over other villages who, you know, they, they refer to them as, they, they used to call them the, the guys, like they would come in helmets so that they couldn't be identified and they would point out people in the village. And the village's hatred is so much directed towards their, those from within the village, way more than they felt the enemy, you know, the enmity of the soldiers from the other side, from the enemy side. And, you know, that's something that's not going to be dealt with easily in a, in a kind of, prosecution because that's really it's compromised the trust and the sense of community in the village and so that kind of process of healing is going to require something beyond just what a kind of criminal prosecution can possibly deliver I would say and I think that this is where I say to survivors I think the work that they have done without all of that support of you know a formal justice response actually is really valuable because they have somehow managed to find ways to to continue their sense of community even when you have those huge breaches of trust and even when you have that kind of breakdown at the social level yeah thank you very much Karan uh also um like when you all uh, spoke uh, like this uh leitmotif that uh, like war crimes and uh I don't know even how to call it like normal crimes <laughs> like it's really um uh, for me it's a little bit bothering why like why we add this like war crime and everything changed because like I feel that uh, it is different like war crime different from normal crime as I put it but at the same time there is no so much difference uh, which we want like to to put especially now when I um, like um, attend uh, different uh, like official uh, um, events about like justice international justice war crimes it's uh, uh, a lot of uh, like a lot of this like division that's uh, crimes war crime like uh, how to how to put like for example if rape uh, it's like uh, uh, first of time rape uh, was uh, like exist because of war but it's not really true as uh, as Grana uh, said so uh, I want maybe we can uh, speak a little bit about uh, this uh, like but not in terms uh, is there is really difference but maybe how this different helps us or not help us. Uh, for uh, searching justice, like in some some this way. Maybe I can start. Um, I, I mean, I think it's a, it's an interesting question, and I think, um, uh, you know, I think one of the the things, the problems with the kind of international justice project is that. We're trying to deal with everything from kind of very high level, uh, you know, the, the decision of one state to occupy another state and, you know, and and the kind of the, the big kind of political projects that are associated with that um, through to individual acts of violence and um, and harm. And I mean, one of the things that does become very complicated when you're talking about those individual type harms is um, how you distinguish the motivations. Like when does something become, when is something an ordinary crime and when does it turn into a, a war crime? Um, 
you know, I mean, then it, it's purely about the external context, but often, you know, the kind of ordinary crimes that are committed are committed because the opportunity, you know, maybe a greater opportunity arrives in a particular context. So, you know, go, to go back to my example of, of um, the, the collaborators who identified people in the village, you know, often the saddest, the reason why villagers were so angry and upset about these things is because often these became ways in which petty feuds were resolved or, you know, like revenge, like a, a for a, a slighting that happened, then takes on a different dynamic because you suddenly, because of the context of war, um, you know, you, you can now mobilize a whole lot more violence in, in response. You know, there's a very famous example in Sri Lanka of um, a group of schoolboys who were disappeared in 1995, I think, um, and their remains were later discovered in a mass grave. And, you know, so this was like a, a during a, a particular period of political violence and everyone assumed that it was associated with that political violence. As it turns out, it was um, the result of a headmaster of the school that the, the boys went to, that the boys had been teasing his daughter or, a, a, or his niece or something. Um, and he went and reported all the boys to the local authorities saying that they were members of, of the JVP, which was the, the insurrectionist movement. So the boys were taken, um, tortured and, and killed. And, you know, I mean, I think one of the things that makes some of those types of acts even more horrendous is because of not even more horrendous. That's the thing. This is where, you know, we the, trying to kind of create scales of suffering becomes really problematic as well. Um, but, you know, it, it was for a motivation that actually had nothing to do with the political violence, but the situation of political violence created an opportunity for that type of crime. So does that make it a, a, a war crime or does it make it an ordinary crime? I, I mean, and, and, and what difference does that make? It's like, you know, I've said this sometimes controversially in relation to rape as a weapon of war. You know, I have had the good fortune of not having been raped in a war and not having been raped by my partner or any male member of my family. I don't know which is worse, but I suspect nobody knows which is worse. You know, this, the, the experience is for a survivor of, of violation and of harm is personal and you know trying to to use external circumstances to evaluate which one is more significant to a person i think is always going to be a bit limited um but you know i think obviously when we're talking about situations like lebanon like ukraine um you know where you're talking about a, an orchestrated political venture or like an occupation, like an armed conflict, you know, an, an intervention in another place. You know, I understand the the importance of, of naming these as somehow more significant or, but, you know, again, it goes back, like when we talk about justice, you know, it goes back to the question of whose interests are being served by what we name as particular crimes and what we name as more significant crimes. Like Elia, your example of, you know, who was denied amnesty, or, you know, what made those more significant I mean, and in who, you know, in whose opinion, and I understand that there's kind of political negotiations that go on, but, you know, when it comes down to the experience of suffering, then that kind of hierarchy and suffering of like, this is a more significant, you know, if we call something a genocide, does it change it for somebody as opposed to if it's a crime against humanity? I, I don't, I think from the point of view of the person harmed, it, it doesn't it's these are externally driven categories that we are putting onto things um, but often they're not about actually responding to the particular experience of harm they're responding to a set of other circumstances that need to be responded to well, thank you Karan, for your comment i can add yeah, yeah just quickly um in fact those distinctions which i hear are pretty artificial are often used to downplay certain crimes over others for example in the case of syria at no point did the un call the Assad regime's repression the term genocide because it didn't fit the ethnic category because they're technically part of the same ethnicity or whatever but they went as far as to call it like accusing the regime of uh, the crime of extermination basically which is supposedly like one step below genocide 
but functionally, what's the difference for hundreds of thousands who were murdered and, and you know, forcibly disappeared and, and, and whatever? And in the case of, of uh, Israel and Gaza right now, it's the same thing. You still have large organizations, human rights organizations, uh, Amnesty, HRW, others who don't use the term genocide, they use other terms uh, for legal reasons because of intent or whatever, whereas others have concluded it's genocide. And it kind of feels like it's been 13 months of the same thing happening. And you have large groups kind of debating probably between one another for the most part, whether, whether to use the G word effectively, effectively or not. And although I did, in this case, I do think the term applies, even if it didn't, why would that still not be a horrible thing happening and a crime against humanity, basically? The hierarchy is, is kind of bizarre because legally, I don't think for the most part, it, it makes much of a difference. And there are disagreements even within the legal field, as far as I'm not a lawyer, but from what I understand. But it it's kind of feels like it's more about how do we categorize this within an international system rather than like, what are we doing to stop the violence? What are we doing to repair things, fix things, uh, move beyond things, heal things, you know, what have you. And again, Lebanon is indicative because it's over three decades of this. And it's, if anything, it's just gotten worse. So, yeah. Uh, thank you, Liam. Uh, Grand Alexander, do you want to add something or? Um... Uh, Grand, are you going to say something? Please go ahead. I will. I will. No, no, just you can, and then I can reflect. I got a couple of things that I want to kind of. No, no worries. Please, please, please. No, the first, I mean, the first thing that I want to kind of think, and I will actually use feminist analysis and the question of continuum of violence and I mean you would actually kind of that's why I have a problem and kind of always when I mention war I'm kind of skeptical because if we talk about I and use kind of understanding for quite a lot of women war is in the home every day no matter what is going on in a, a surrounding so that I mean so there are quite lots of things, and Kiran actually mentioned it when she was talking uh, uh, at the beginning. Uh, it, there is a quite a lots of examples of continued a continuum of violence. Just the question is that kind of within the this kind of war context, uh, it is more allowed because there is a kind of disbalance of. Uh, normality what we define as a norm and accept what do we and what the level what level of violence we accept this is the same when i said in the context of my demands for justice were more violent during the siege than after the siege because in the context i would actually dream of the capital punishment which as a kind of something outside of the siege circumstances i would never think of it's just the example so, uh, and when, and Skiran also correctly said experience of rape, for example, is personal, but uh, what's the difference even in this kind of mass rapes, because we can't, we usually connect war and a mass rapes when we have that in the context of gang rapes in so-called peacetime. So it is the I mean, the, and what is the war crime and how do we accept? I mean, it is, and there is no, and there is constantly attempts of talking about that there is no, that shouldn't be hierarchy of crimes, even within the international criminal law, it is explicitly said so. The problem is, and this is something I would actually use with Gaza, when people start using made up terms like ethnic cleansing, which is not prosecutable, which is not, I mean, which is actually coming from the uh, different perpetrator uh, using it exactly for the purpose of not, and this is coming from the former, uh, from uh, Bosnia, and it was actually termed by, used by Slobodan Milosevic uh, to actually kind of justify that it's not genocide or crimes against humanity. So, for example, the problem is more about using terminology that isn't legally relevant and uh, to undermine something rather than 
valorers uh, kind of use whether it's ge uh, genocide or crime as a, a crime against humanity. I mean that that would that would some, be something that is problematic. Uh, but I would kind of say in a legal term, I would kind of argue that uh, in context of Gaza, genocide is has kind of access to two two different courts, being ICJ and ICC, rather than just uh, ICC. So that would be more political kind of also choice, but rather than and and, and we are back to the political choice rather than act actuality and needs of the uh, and feelings of the or needs experiences of survivors and I'll stop there. Я буду говорити українською. I will be speaking in Ukrainian. I would like to add that to make an addition to everything said by previous speakers that uh, I would like to lay part of this accountability for this hierarchy of crimes on big media that fighting against each other for the attention of their readers brought us to the situation when shock content, loud names, loud titles, they create some story right about a particular certain circumstance. They brought us to the situation that instead of reading the article and understanding what's actually going on in a particular country or with a particular group, we actually live through shock emotions because of loud words or angry words. And I think it's kind of a dictatorship of Western media, of their impact on the narrative of, of justice, of uh, that narrative that we are trying to build as for justice, because it's crucial as soon as we are able to change the approach of the big Western media to the wars, conflicts, to the way we consider justice, this, I believe, will be a key moment for us to stop this race of everything bad. I believe that we, uh, on this note, we can speak a little bit about uh, like feeling of solidarity and uh, uh, like uh, why I think about it because it's really, as we said, it's really difficult to feel what uh, other person feel. It's actually like impossible. It's just uh, just this. Um, but at the same time, as uh, like Oksana said, all of this like media trying to. Uh, like to show us this uh, um... oh strajdanya I forgot, forgot how to sculpt like uh, suffering uh, <laughs> suffering strajdanya suffering uh, okay like uh, suffering suffering like uh, all media show the suffering that uh, like like you could uh, you could feel this suffering so you could be solidar with people but what we actually see that this uh, showing suffering from uh, uh, like from different part of our world actually don't create a strong feeling of solidarity and if we like speak with this um, like illusion in some way separation of war crimes and like uh, ordinary uh, or regular crimes uh, does it mean that, for example, we can build solidarity, uh, better solidarity? I don't know how, like, uh, how I can put it in question more clear. <laughs> but if you can answer something, I will be really happy. Kiran? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think your your question is is something that I've been puzzling a lot about, and I just. So I'll just give a little reflection. Um, so uh, last month um, I brought a Palestinian friend of mine um, and one of her students to Sri Lanka to do a little sort of study and speaking tour in Sri Lanka. Um, and I took them to the north where the, the final stage of the war in Sri Lanka had a very sort of the, the Sri Lankan authorities used a very similar approach to what the Israelis have done in Gaza of, you know, barricading off this particular strip of land, moving, you know, telling civilians to move into areas that were 
supposedly no fire zones, then bombarding them, you know, limiting supplies of food, et cetera, into the area. And um, and then uh, afterwards, we they did some talks at universities and, and organizations. And I was really struck by the fact that amongst the older generation of Sri Lankans, um, particularly the, those, the Tamil population who had experienced, you know, the, the state of oppression and war in Sri Lanka, um, but also, you know, kind of a lot across the, the kind of progressive left, the older generation um, felt a very strong feeling of solidarity with Palestine. So they spoke about how in the 70s and 80s, you know, the newspapers in in the north would it would have stories about Palestine. There was a lot of kind of connections between the freedom fighter movements in Sri Lanka and the PLO and also the Kurdish movement. Um, and they felt like even now they still were following and feeling a lot of, of strong feelings of, of solidarity. Amongst the younger generation, um, a few of, of the young Tamils that I know um, were telling me stories. So amongst younger Sri Lankans, um, it's been a much more ambivalent relationship to what's happened in Gaza. And so I'm involved with some of the kind of pro-Palestine stuff here in Sri Lanka, and we're dealing with quite a, an intense amount of um, acceptance of Zionist talking points um, and, and a kind of reluctance to question those, and uh, including amongst the Tamil population. And so some of my friends who are Tamil were kind of asking the question of, well, why, you know, like, can't you see that this narrative, and they would say things like, well, Hamas are terrorists. And, you know, the young Tamil people would say, yeah, but don't you remember that's exactly how the Tamil Tigers were referred to as terrorists, which justified the bombardment of all Tamil people. And somehow they made this kind of distinction in their mind between their movement and, and the Palestinian movement. And now it's really only amongst young Muslim Sri Lankans that there is a sense of connection. So that's got me really thinking about what has changed in the world um, that, that that sense of, of connectedness of struggles is not felt so clearly. And um, and it, it only happens if you can invoke some kind of religious or ethnic kind of identification. So, I mean, I think there's lots of ways in which we could understand that. But I my pessimistic reading is that actually I feel like, you know, the kind of replacement of a, of a kind of third world anti-imperial movement with a kind of universal human rights movement that actually in some, for some reason, paradoxically, that's actually broken a sense of, of connections. Um, and, and I'm not sure, like I, I, this is just a thought and I'm really interested to hear what others think about this. And that's why I think your initiative is really great, like how you're trying to build these conversations. Because I don't understand why, but it does seem like that kind of feeling of interconnectedness that of the global south is not strongly felt. And so even amongst, for example, the Palestinians who were here, when they were asked by the older Sri Lankans about the Kurdish movement, they didn't know anything about the Kurdish movement. They didn't feel connected with the Kurdish movement. So, uh, you know, that I find that very interesting. And I would like to know what it is about this particular historical moment that has led to that feeling of disconnectedness and why the universal human rights framework hasn't built the connections or maybe has even undermined them. Uh, uh, Elia, please add. Yeah, um, this is, I mean, I'm sure it won't be, it's not the complete answer. I don't think there is one, but I think part of it in my mind, in any case, and this is like exp from experience of just speaking to through the podcast and other stuff, speaking with folks from, from Bosnia, from Ukraine, from Hong Kong, Taiwan, other uh, Tigray, other places, that there seems to be a, an assumption of precarity in the sense that like, sure, most people are fine with the idea of universal human rights. Very few people would outright say this is not a good thing or whatever, unless they are explicitly far right nationalist, fascist, Nazis, etc. But most people also seem to believe that like, it's a nice idea. It's a good thing to aspire to, but like, it's not quote unquote realistic. I either like in most cases, if if everyone gets human rights, like I lose something or my community loses something or whatever it might be. Obviously, this is just part of part of the, the picture here in the generalization. But I've seen this a number of times of like, why don't we see more 
like we see more solidarity between Syrians and Ukrainians than we do between Palestinians and Ukrainians. And between Syrians and Ukrainians, it seems more straightforward, quote unquote, because what well, Russia is the bad guy in both cases. It's kind of easy, like enemy of my enemy. Um, whereas in the case of Palestine, I would still argue that the enemy or quote unquote enemies are have more in common than than not. But it's almost like it requires w one more step to think about it in those terms by seeing like the problem being authoritarian governments, the genocidal governments, rather than like specifically only this versus that, because the Russians say that they support Palestine, even though they, there's no concrete way in which they have ever done that. Uh, that is sufficient in terms of discourse to, at, at the very least, convince lots of people that because the West is extremely hypocritical and even actively complicit in the genocide, therefore the people who hate the West, China and Russia in this case, are the good guys. You know, I'm simplifying a bit, but it, it seems to be a, a big part of the problem that we see the same kind of discourses. Again, you have variations of this and not everyone is necessarily this explicit. But like denying the, the 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 that the cultural genocide in Xinjiang, for example, while saying free Palestine, most people don't go that far in those specific terms. But it's almost like the implication is a bit there that like only only one quote unquote side can be the the genocidal actor or or whatever, and it is it is a shame. I think it comes from a state centric worldview for the most part for most people. And again, I do think there is this assumption of precarity as if like both things cannot be true at the same time. Um, and yeah, I don't know what to go from there specifically because I think it comes a lot from conversations between different, a bit like we're doing here and kind of finding the, the things in common. If it's not like the enemy in a kind of a, you know, oh, it's just Russia bombing both countries and therefore it's most straightforward. Uh, even though the Americans have also bombed Syria, so, you know. It's it's it it can be more complicated, but I think it's often rendered more complicated than it need to because it depends on which frameworks we're taking, uh, or wh which frameworks we're centering. If that makes sense. Uh, Garana. I'll try. I'll try short, but yeah, I mean, I would agree with Elia in that context of uh, problems, but that's really simply neoliberal, I mean, neoliberal thinking of identities and individualism intertwine. And the problem is also that somehow there is a problem and there is a lack of vision in the left uh, political thought at the moment, because we are, and this needs to be addressed because we keep tending kind of seeing one side of imperialism rather than all, I mean, complete picture of imperialism. We tend to kind of uh, somehow have a feeling, a uh, nostalgic feeling and referencing all good times when, yeah, you, there, there is a huge problem of really uh, understanding full-on imperialism, understanding whole problems of the nationalism, understanding all problems of identitarian politics. We just tend to kind of uh, look particulars and this is the problem and I'll just stop there of currently lack of the political vision of the left. Oksana, do you want to add something? I just wanted to add very briefly. I second fully with what you've said. I support what uh, everyone, all the previous speakers have said, but I just wanted to highlight that right now we are talking about solidarity, which needs resources. Instead, we are awaiting groups that do not have those kinds of resources. We are waiting for them to give us the solidarity. Without the intellectual, the emotional resources, without taking that or drawing on that from these communities, it's impossible to speak of building solidarity. Uh, really great uh, reflection from uh, all of you. Uh, it's, um, yeah, uh, maybe like just last round. What I want, uh, like we speak about um, uh, about about uh, rep reparations. Like during the war, we have a lot of cases where like reparation in literal meaning 
isn't possible at all. Uh, at the same time, uh, Garana said a lot about like this uh, additional uh, perspective of justice when we speak about uh, economic justice. Um, and like what I think during uh, your like your speeches, it's about this um, embodied justice in a like in collective way of living. So when we speak about war crimes, we should speak about justice actually for all. Uh, like maybe because it's like mass, uh, massive, uh, and that it works like this. Maybe it works not only like uh, regarding war crimes, but we don't think about this uh, like uh, in uh, case of ordinary crimes, uh, as we said. Uh, so I want uh, to ask you how we can. Um, like using this collective perspective for reparation, um, how we can embody it maybe in larger policy in country. So how we can speak about reparation for survivors in sense not to repair them, but repair um, like community in community sense. Uh, not making them separate because they actually separated uh, uh, by war crimes and when we trying to make this like policy for survivors maybe we separated them even more or not like i will be really happy to hear your thoughts about this i'll just start but and i'll say that this is a completely new conversation in a sense for another three hours discussion but yes individual reparations do separate and do make a kind of a hierarchical uh, hierarchical position and competitions between the survivors themselves and creating different uh, communities in a sense through the identity of the crime committed. Uh, we, I mean, from the experience in Bosnia, we have been quite, a, right. I mean, me and my colleague Nella Porobic, Isakovic have been quite uh, thinking a lot about reparations and talking about and even writing some kind of ish, uh, frameworks, gender sensitive frameworks of reparation. And what we kind of learned for, from these 30 years of uh, kind of post-war situation in Bosnia, there is never going to be sufficient resources to address every single crime individually, but it needs to be uh, organized and kind of addressed and repaired through the community and through, for example, even thinking about infrastructure. If we have, and I'll just do use the illustration, if we have at the moment war, and there are quite a lot of people that uh, have been wounded, uh, have lost, uh, have, uh, have uh, kind of survived certain traumatic experiences, in the aftermath of the war, we really need to think about building infrastructure in such a way, building, for example, healthcare system in such a way, and, edu and medical education as well, uh, in such a way to be able to address the traumatic experiences, to be able to address people uh, who have, uh, have had shrapnels in their heads or anything, to think about that as a community on on the community level and also what do we do for example if we have individual reparation and that reparation says that the person has uh, has a priority in accessing healthcare system when healthcare system has crumbled so when no one can actually access it what does it mean it actually really means that we need to act, uh, strengthen our healthcare system, and this is public healthcare system, in order for everyone to actually have equal uh, access to qual good quality healthcare system, in order to, for example, have these uh, priorities in, spe uh, in spe specialized care. So I don't know whether I make sense, but for example, Bosnia, and this is, and I'll end up uh, in Bosnia peace agreement without, I mean, that was imposed on us. No one actually ever asked us about it. 
uh, explicitly in the constitution pointed out that Bosnia, uh, the free market economy is the value system in Bosnia. And uh, that kind of really trickled down to uh, trickle down to indiv I mean individualizing everything and privatizing everything and we, uh, the reparation even though certain groups got access to certain uh, kinds of reparations on the paper they never received it because public public healthcare system public uh, and uh, ser service provision was completely removed so it needs to be a really, I mean, I would actually argue for far more uh, thinking about preparation in a collective sense. And another, sorry, and I, another thing is I at the beginning said that no, there is no homogenous experience of the survivor, but it's heterogeneous. Only community and wider aspects would actually allow us that. So that uh, women, uh, sorry, survivors that uh, survive, for example, wartime rape or rape in general, have access to uh, psychological support if they need it, that it's not the only support that they get, uh, get or uh, gynecological or any other form of... So it's just really about these kind of intersecting uh, needs and, yeah, addressing them. Sorry. Thank you, Grana, very much. Um, anyone want to add something? Yeah, maybe I can just say, just to build on what um, Grana was saying, um, that, I mean, I I'd said that there have just been elections in Sri Lanka, and one of the most striking things is for the first time ever, the north of the country, has voted for a non Tamil party as as they voted for a party from the south, and you know if we are try if we try to understand why that is, it's not because the question of um, accountability of you know the political question of of how Tamils have been oppressed by the state has been dropped or not answered anymore. It's because for Tamil people now their their demands are very clearly. We need responses at the economic level. We need to have access to that, to the development that the other parts of the country have had that we haven't had. We need, and and none of the political questions have gone away. They will have to be addressed as well. But, you know, there's a real shift now it, at the level of the population to say, you know, we've waited too long to say that, oh, if we get some kind of political solution or some kind of, you know, formal justice, that that will deliver a reward. And now you can see, and I mean, many people have been saying this for many years, but they've really sort of sent that message very clearly in the election that to kind of reinforce what Goran is saying, that actually the, the, the rest of the question of justice has to be grounded in responding to the economic needs of the population in their day-to-day -day lives. Oh, so I believe we need to finish. You asked me how long it will be. So two hours uh, <laughs> uh, as uh, uh, it's, so it marker that it was really interesting. Um, actually, I found a lot of new thoughts and I feel like uh, I'm working intellectually, uh, listening to you. Uh, yeah, uh, so thank you very much for participation. Um, yeah, hope that we, in some point, we can continue our conversation. As Garana said, uh, we 